good evening everyone, thanks for being here, I really appreciate your persistence despite the weather. Um, thanks to Sinopantha for hosting this conversation this evening, uh, and also to the Goa College of Architecture for being partners uh, in this program, uh, and particularly to Dr. Vishwesh Kandalga. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists this evening. I'd like to begin with uh, Dr. Danny Bart who is a Senior Lecturer in Interdisciplinary Practice and Graduate Research Convener, Design at Victorian College of the Arts, University of Melbourne, Australia. He is the author of Artistic Research in the Future Academy, published by University of Chicago Press and Intellect in 2017. Premji Shantari is a curator and writer based in Delhi, and initiator of the curatorial platform Future Collaborations. His recent article, What Does Art Artists Think? Making a Case for Artistic Practices Research, was recently published by the Journal for Artistic Research and I believe is available online. Uh, so it's open access. Um, and then finally, a very warm welcome to Go and Nurse researcher Dr. Ruth D'Souza. Ruth returns to her roots in Goa. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, she is the Vice Chancellor's Fellow in the School of Art at RMIT University of Australia. Her work addresses issues of cultural safety and health with a focus on digital technologies, participatory co design, and structural racism. She's host of the Birthing and Justice podcast and is based in Victoria, Australia, with ancestral ties to Barbados. Uh, today's conversation uh, will be led by uh, Dr. Daniel Bart. Uh, who will engage our fellow panelists in conversation, and uh, followed by which, if we're really nice, they will take questions from the audience. So over to you first. Thank you. Uh, nursing and medical sciences. 
Uh, nursing is another field which has been traditionally understood as mere labor, um, and that it just enacts essentially a process of medical knowledge that comes from doctors. Uh, the, the biomedical knowledge of doctors is like a flowchart or a chatbot, right? Uh, I think it just essentially tries to segment you into a diagnosis so that you can have the most validated treatment. That's primarily what uh, a, a doctor would do. But we know you that. Might have to have a fight with me, actually, later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I, I, yeah, this is the model of training. But, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, a, a doctor is trained in how you live a healthy life because their mode of engagement with you is structured in the West around 15 minute intermittent conversations where they refer you off to a specialist of some, depending on which part of the flow chart you end up in. Nurses, on the other hand, have intimate knowledge built on the long-term experience of care, and it's forged out of a sequence of singular examples. It's, it's like it, it comes through practice in some way. And so, in this way, the knowledge in nursing is perhaps uh, more like the practical knowledge of the artist. And I'll be asking Ruth more about that uh, on our panel. As, as Western forms of knowledge struggle with the failure of modernist, technocratic or science-based uh, research to address our problems as people and the problems of the planet, uh, we can think about climate change, for example, We've, there's also a recognition happening inside the academy and inside the sciences um, that there are many other ways that, and many other cultural settings in which the, the, the context of knowledge can be understood. So, uh, a teacher of mine, Gertrude Chakravorty Spivak, says that the colonial idea that the telos or the ratios of knowledge that are forged in Northwestern Europe um, that were sent out across the world through the colonial process, the idea that these can describe the situation of practitioners everywhere in every situation is in need of constant critique because it's clearly incorrect. So uh, for those of us who are outside an indigenous knowledge frame, this isn't really as simple as adopting a decolonial approach or escaping this kind of colonial knowledge because the culture, uh, the institutions that we work in, uh, the cultural forms and language we use are thoroughly determined by a colonial mentality. Right? They make us uh, who we are. Yet in every context, we can see specific gaps or slippages um, that allow us to rethink some of these colonial assumptions. And I think in the recent work of uh, Prem Jushichari, I've, I've learned more about what might be at stake when we think about artistic knowledge um, particularly in the context of uh, the Indian nation-state, as complex as it is. And that's another kind of, maybe an opening from which we can start to talk. So um, I'm hoping that in tonight's conversation between these two we'll find some interesting points of resonance uh, and we can pick those up in discussion with you, with you later on. So um, I just have uh, maybe two questions for each of you. And then one question for both of you. And I'll be running over to do some slides in between. Um, so starting with you, Ruth, uh, you've had a career in health research and, uh, and you have clinical experience working as a nurse and a therapist. And now you're working in the School of Art at RMIT University. And you focused your work on culture and specific Tanzania to work. Um, and that's where both my parents were born, and that's where I was born, and my two sisters were born in Kenya. But I'm aware that um, it gives me a kind of quite different perspective. And then growing up in New Zealand, the Pacific, the Kingdom of Tonga, and then working in Australia, England, Switzerland, just, uh, you know, my heart is going, but I've also got all these other places that inform my work. And I guess one of the questions that's been a big part of my life, and um, I don't know if this happens in Goa, but maybe it's just me, but there's always a, a long story to get to the answer, and it's a bit circular. So forgive me for this circularity. Um, 
And um, I think with having lived in countries that were colonized, you know, that's primarily where I've grown up. So Tanzania and Kenya, uh, post-independence, and then in Aotearoa, New Zealand, has really given me a unique perspective and particularly made me ask, what is my place as someone who's not been invited by indigenous people? What does it mean to be an uninvited guest in a country that is not mine? And yet have a place I can return to where I've got some kind of legitimacy, maybe some authority, family connections and roots that are very deep. What does it mean to be outside of that place and be somewhere else. So I just wanted to kind of preface that because it's a position of disquiet, as other people have written, um, being in the middle of the colonial sandwich. And I guess in Aotearoa and Australia, one of the questions that's been really important to me is where do I fit in the kind of in the kind of debate, uh, tension, anxiety. Uh, between indigenous people and settlers. Because I'm a settler of colour, but I also have a, a different relationship to white settlers. And that's kind of a very long-winded way of trying to introduce the concept of cultural safety, which comes from Māori nurses. So Māori are the indigenous people of New Zealand. And I'm very, very grateful for growing up in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And Danny, my question might include question one and question three. You know, I might combine them because they're interrelated. Um, so one of the things that Māori have taught me have, has been you need to know where you're from and you need to know who your people are wherever you are. Because if you have that, you have everything. So I'm very grateful for to my parents who started bringing me back to Goa from the age of 10. Um, in my professional life, Māori nurses have taught me about the concept of cultural safety. And it's an explicit post-colonial critical race theory around challenging the assumptions of the health system and the idea that the health system is universal and equitable for everybody. So it's the idea that every one of us bears culture, is a bearer of culture. And it's quite a difficult kind of concept for my white students to understand because they don't see themselves as having a culture. And that's because um, actually their culture is the dominant culture and it's everywhere. And when something's dominant, you don't always see it. It's just taken for granted. So cultural safety is that idea that when you're someone providing a, a service to somebody, you need to interrogate your own identity and ask who you are and what you bring and what kind of values you bring to the encounter of this. So for example, we might have um, assumptions about how someone should behave when they're unwell, or when they're well, how much responsibility they should take. Um, and in New Zealand, what I've learned is that, very similar to, I think, our golden ways, that a lot of decisions are made very collectively. They're not necessarily made by the individual. So cultural safety demands that we don't learn about other people. So it's not like, oh, here's someone different from me. I should learn about them. But it's that idea that we should think about who are we and what are we bringing with us wherever we go, even though that place is different. I'm feeling like this is a very long winded answer. So um, for me, cultural safety is not just about culture, but all the other axes of identity that we bring with us as human beings, whether that's caste, class, ability, gender, it's, you know, sexuality, etc, etc. Um, how are those differences taken into account in a meaningful way by institutions? 
So, so cultural safety is this institutional critique that says, if we're going to give care to somebody, we give it to them taking into account everything that makes up that person, while also being aware of all the assumptions we have about those axes of difference. Hopefully that makes sense. So the thing that I love about having moved from being a clinician, because as a nurse in New Zealand, it's very really hard uh, to be both a doer, you know, in a practice-based discipline, but also to think about doing, yeah, which is the theory and the practice. And please read uh, Prem Trisha's wonderful paper about thinking and doing, because I think that, that, you know, there are lots of resonances in nursing and health. So I guess what I find really exciting about art and design is the potential that they hold for being truly participatory, for creating opportunities for as many people who are marginalised by systems to actually participate in meaningful ways and get their health needs met. So that's a very long-winded way of trying to explain what those concepts are. And I wonder if a way of making it real is to show some images, Danny? Because I'm waffling on a lot, I know. <laughs> so, um, so one of the things that I've done while based in the School of Art is to attempt to make research meaningful to people who aren't normal stakeholders or recipients of, um, or beneficiaries of our traditional academic outputs. And I just want to share this one with you. Um, I worked with a cartoon, cartoonist, artist, thank you, um, to try and write the stories of older people in Australia, where I now live. So I moved, after I finished my PhD, I moved from New Zealand to Australia because I couldn't really find any work and the kind of work that I wanted. Um, so I collaborated with a, an artist and this was published in The Guardian. So if you search for my name, you will find this work. And what we did was we interviewed older people who are migrants from Greece, from Italy, from India, from Sri Lanka, from Egypt, um, about their experiences of the pandemic and how they use technology to communicate with family or to access health services. What I love about this work, work is there aren't too many words. There's lots of absolutely beautiful images that kind of capture the heart of each person's story. And so for me, um, which will be a contrast to many Premjish's arguments, I, I, I've used art in a very instrumental kind of way to try and widen the people who can care about this topic. So I could have just published this in a peer-reviewed journal, for which I get more points. Do you know what I mean as an academic? Like, in Australia, the kind of outputs from research that are valued are the ones that are in peer-reviewed journals that are top tier. And for me, it's like, well, does that actually change the living conditions of the people who are older and socially isolated. Because what happened during COVID is Australia pivoted to move to moving all the health services online. And so for me, it's kind of like, wow. Lot a gallery context, and I think one of the things that's interesting that uh, maybe documented this year in particular is bringing up is the way that this is changing and our expectations of fine art is changing and our understandings of what um, what a gallery is for and what an artist is for is changing. And uh, so Premjish, uh, you know, I think you can uh, also respond uh, here to Ruth, but um, I, I guess I, I was kind of interested in your position as an independent curator as well as being an academic and scholar um, being right at the nexus of so many of these questions. Um, and your recent article um, on 
what does our, our distinct making case for artistic practices research. Um, you, you make a critique of policies underpinning the implementation of studio-based PhDs in the Indian context. And at one point in the article, I think kind of coming, this is where I sense a connection to Ruth's practice, you say that the, the boundaries of visuality and the production of proper bodies legitimized in art departments have to be dislodged. And I just wondered if you could um, talk a, a, about a bit more about what it is in art education that you think um, requires transformation or has the potential for transformation. And then also maybe into some things that we're going to talk about later. Um, I, 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 I was very interested in your articulation of the link between artistic research and um, and uh, caste-based activism as well, and, and the importance of thinking about that. So, yeah. So I wonder if you could maybe move us from from, from that thread into uh, in, in, into into your own work. Well, you like to think. <laughs> we all like the pink one. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question, and also. Thank you, Ruth, for uh, bringing in these diverse perspectives of existence under illness, idleness, and severity. I'll, I'll come to that later on also. But before that, I would like to thank uh, Sunabrata for organizing this. And uh, thank you, Nani. Thank you, Ruth, for also inviting me here. So it's a wonderful opportunity to expand on some of those discussions which we have already started. Thank you, Benny, for again moderating the session, introducing us, and thank you, College of Architecture, too, for organizing this. There's a context to this discussion, and this article was written in a very important context, and I hope all of you should understand this context because uh, in the last few years, uh, we are all discussed where practice-based PhDs, are practice-based PhDs are getting introduced across India. And it is introduced in a very hasty manner. Of course, there are discussions at all, but what is happening is that right now, artistic research is understood and it is agreed upon as a research. So that's why. But the problem is that, that there are equivalences that are created. Whereas artistic research and the parameters that will be used to be, uh, evaluate artistic research are actually borrowed from disciplines such as sociology, history and all, which are also uh, the outputs basically are textual as you know. It requires you to publish an article, it requires you to have an edited chapter in a book and all, and artistic research and practice does not operate like that. Furthermore, uh, I also feel that artistic research is desire-led. It is also an embodied practice. And so how do we assess this desire-led, embodied, utopic practice through these rational parameters? And we have not actually used this opportunity to question the way research is conducted in campuses. So that is the context of the article and I'm very glad that though it's published in, a, in an academic journal, but still I have getting messages from uh, Brazil, Johannesburg, uh, now yesterday from Lisbon, that people are reading it and they're sharing it and they're finding it very important to add on to the discussion. So I'm very happy about that. Coming to the discussion which we have started right now uh, is the experience of disability and why it is important to bring the disability question into art practice, artistic thinking, and art pedagogy is what I'm going to elaborate today. Few weeks back, uh, I was in Vishakhapatnam or Vaisal, where I was uh, directing a film, and and it's on a sculpture. So one of the important discussions I was having, and this exposes my contradiction and my duplicity of what I have written and what I said is basically so we were discussing about how it's important to have a good body to maintain good diet and everything in order to work now after a few 
few days I realized the stupidity which I made while making all those comments is that what about the disabled body? How would the disabled body make a sculpture? Can that person make a sculpture? Can, can that ill person make a sculpture? Can a sick person make a sculpture? Can an old person make a sculpture? Why would we need an able body to make a sculpture? Why would we need an able body to perform the artistic thinking and artistic making? And this also led me to many general kind of uh, observations about galleries, art openings and all that. Why don't we see enough wheelchairs in the gallery openings? Why don't we see enough crutches and again disabled artists inside the gallery openings? Where are they? Where are the disabled artists? And so this is something uh, which also led me to the construction of the proper body type, starting from the modern, modernism in Indian art. And one person which I would like to make point to is uh, David Prasad Roy Chaudhary, many of you may be familiar of his sculptures, Triumph of Labor and all, which is about his tight masculine bodies performing labor. It's called Triumph of Labor. And D.P. Roy Chaudhary himself as an artist used to exercise, he used to use like a kabaddi player and all that to like celebrate this kind of masculinity, masculine body type. So this is where the question of why we should have a disabled perspective comes into the picture. And I am not talking about representing disability as images. That's not what I am talking about. I am talking about bringing the experience of art making by the disabled person. What happens there is what I am interested in talking to. And I would like to make this statement that we have not unlearned the body. There is still a lot of work that has to be done to unlearn the body, the normative body which, in which we are conditioned to operate, in which we are conditioned to understand ourselves and other bodies. And, and by doing that, we other the disabled body. So there is enough unlearning that has to be done. And we need to create a new pedagogy that is at the intersection of art history, disability, artistic research and curatorial research. This is what we need. And it will be very, it will be hugely benefiting for the discipline of art practice itself. That when we bring this perspective of disability, when we bring the experiences of disability, and when we also brace together artists with disability and artists without disability and trying to understand the practice and expand the idea of a practice without creating these narratives of proper bodies and all, I think it will open up the field a little more and it will be very interesting to me. And as I said earlier, my, my idea here, my attempt here is not to uh, again open up questions of accessibility. That's not what I'm doing again. Accessibility, there's a lot of interesting research and work and intervention that's happening in museums, so that's not what I'm trying to do. But I am trying to integrate the disability perspective with artistic research. That's what I want to do. So how the disabled artist, the disabled practitioner, their body functions while they are creating art, their mind functions, their senses function, and how we can use this process, how we can use this idea of cognition and performing and integrate that with the pedagogy of making is something I'm interested in and I'm proposing that we should heavily invest in that. And how could we study the experiences of the disabled and disabled bodies just as they are? So uh, one example I would like to discuss today is about the landscape painting. For example, if we have a landscape painting painted by a disabled artist and a, a, like a non-disabled, it's a landscape, the content is the same. But then when we engage with the form, when we engage with the process of making, we engage with the brush strokes and all, what does it reveal to us? How much of visuality can actually provide evidence about the conditions of disability? And I am not in favor of using artwork as a forensic evidence to understand the conditions of disability. I believe that conditions of disability are embodied and it is it lies in the thinking and that's where we have to go back and that's where we have to work closely with artistic thinking and artistic process.
So when we integrate disabled perspective, we would achieve something like this. Uh, there are a few points uh, of uh, discussion. One is we, are, we will be able to understand the notion of time functioning differently for different people. We will be able to understand body posture and work, how that is different for different people. How people work through illness, idleness and inaction. And how non-normative bodies make art. That's totally different from not how normative bodies make art. And again, how we can deploy concepts of care, vulnerability and intimacy into the existing framework of fine art practice. And this has to be uh, uh, like articulating it in a very basic and this elongated manner is because these nuances of disability and chronic illness like you talked about your white students is because I am articulating it like this is because it's very difficult for the normal body person, the proper body person to understand the difficulties and why it is important to have the disabled perspective into final speaking. So the marginalization that is faced by the disabled body, the violence that is faced by the disabled body, the cultural erasure that is faced by the disabled body is something we have to pay attention to. And also uh, relating to the medical field is that we have to understand that the disabled body is heavily monitored. In the pharmaceutical technological way, it's heavily monitored body. It is always seen as a specimen and it is always tied together with medical procedures. So this is where again an important perspective about integrating disabled body with pedagogy will open up a newer discourses because most of the proper body the able, the normative bodies are not going through this sort of monitoring and medical procedures. But how are these disabled bodies functioning with all these monitoring medicines and being specimens and able to do that? So what is that experience of? And finally to close uh, this part of the discussion is I'm strongly making a binary uh, division here between flexibility and what I call as functional diversity. And I would like to argue is that we all are enchanted by the flexibility economy of designer capitalism which I have mentioned in uh, the article is where we are repeatedly told to be flexible. We have to work 24-7, we have to be creative, we have to be easy, we have to be easily available to shift jobs at any time. We all have to be flexible. And what I propose is that we, are, we should not be flexible, but we should understand the functional diversity of each individual. And there are various from individual to individual, from body to body. And that is what we should uh, uh, engage with in the coming days, is what I'd like to say. Uh, thanks, thanks, Prabhupada. And uh, I'm, I'm aware we will maybe skip some of the material that we're going to cover, but I think there's an interesting uh, question, a link between you know what you've both outlined here. Um, if we think about the work happening in disability studies around the idea of disability as a cultural form, uh, a cultural formation which is enacted by uh, you know a society based on the idea of health but also which has a, um, a, a resistant cultural form which is coming from people who experience what is called disability and, and, and the way that that is enacted culture, the challenge that poses culturally for norm, normative assumptions around um, uh, what we understand to be a body and an artistic body I think is you know, where I see a very interesting intersection between to have uh, elaborated here and potentially into this idea of um, a certain kind of autonomy that that is possible for artists to activate within the work in, t in terms of its ability, the work's ability to um, take a position in, outside of some of the surveillance forms and in a, in, a, in, in, in perhaps an, an uh, autonomous autonomous form. So I think um, you know this brings up some very interesting questions about art's role in relationship to other disciplines and it's maybe it's complementarity or it's supplementarity to other forms of, 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 of knowledge.
knowledge, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I think there's a very interesting sort of intersection between what we have there. Um, I just wondered if you uh, uh, had any questions for each other before we maybe go to, go to the audience for some uh, I, I was thinking about, um, I'm kind of becoming more and more interested in the idea of abolition, you know, and uh, particularly in settler societies where we've inherited uh, institutions that have come from uh, far, far, far away that have superseded indigenous forms of knowledge, ways of knowing, ontologies, epistemologies, etc. I'm kind of interested in um, how, I had a marvellous point to make and I've already forgotten what it was, uh, which happens all the time. Is anyone else getting old? I'm, yeah, I'm getting old. But um, I, I was thinking about how, I made notes as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of interested in how we might resist um, and when you were talking about integrating a disability perspective, my hack was kind of raised because I also think that um, what's happening particularly in the settler societies of Australia and New Zealand is those must be led by the people that have the lived experience, right? And one of the problems has been the kind of biopolitical machinations of health services that kind of, and, and in my field, it's, it's not so much older people, this was one of 24 projects I was doing during COVID, but my, my, my main area has been around birth. And, you know, who is seen as having the right to reproduce, when and how, who, who has the right to be a child, who has the right to be a parent. Um, I'm kind of interested, I keep saying I'm kind of interested, but I'm noticing I'm saying I'm interested. But, you know, how, how art perhaps can challenge those kinds of things, and whether there's a danger that you could reproduce those dynamics. Does that make sense? No, it makes a very complicated question. I know, I, I, was, I talked to things, yeah. so it's like... And, uh, and I always... Uh, I'm a little hesitant to uh, make such observations in front of artists. But, uh, of course, uh, we have to understand that art is ideological and art is again an outcome of the, uh, what you call, various processes and also it is part of the, uh, what you call, it's an outcome of the society, it's an outcome of the, uh, it's not free from, uh, like, uh, like many people would claim that it is free, it is autonomous and all. I'm not hesitant to make such claims, and I will say that it is again interpolated very closely with ideology. And it is part of the ideological apparatus. And that is again the struggle of the art to become uh, autonomous for that matter. So art could easily, uh, easily it could replicate power, power structure. And it could again uh, replicate structures of oppression, it could uh, uh, take part in that. And that is what, uh, if we could just briefly see the presentation, but what I wanted to do, I wanted to show you quickly what these artists are trying to do, because uh, for a long time, the Indian art has been also replicating such structures of power, elitism, exclusion, uh, not only in terms of representing, but also in terms of providing accessibility among the, the, these marginalized subjects, what we call as adults and the uh, Adivasis of India, Dalit uh, means the broken person. And for a long time, caste was not an operative term, an operative concept in India. Nobody addressed the issue of caste, marginality, the cultural violence which the Adivans and the lower class artists they faced. Nobody addressed that. And it's very recently that caste is coming back to India and uh, coming very strongly, challenging the hegemony of modernist practice and also a certain sort of metropolitan, globalized practice. So 
So yes, art has been doing what you said. And, but again, art is challenging that. And it's challenging that in a very interesting way through these young practitioners. Uh, I would just like you to quickly go through this, so just look at these books. This is by Rajita Kumari, who is based in Patna, and these are used saris by uh, lower caste women, working class, lower class, caste women. So this is called uh, the surgery tradition. This is, uh, and this basically she repurposes these saris, and while women make these saris, they also sing these songs, folk songs and local songs. It's also a collection of memories of those women. Uh, why I'm showing you all this, I'll tell you very briefly at the end. And the second one is uh, by Tangil Fund of Arbaz. So these blouse pieces which we are seeing is uh, again recreated in order to talk about how the uh, women from the fishing community, the coolie community, were forced to pay tax if they had to cover their breasts. So this is uh, a kind of retelling of the struggles which the, the fishing community, the coolie community faced. So, uh, so he assembles all these uh, motifs. So those are the uh, coins that they had to pay. So this is uh, old coins which he has assembled. And uh, in front of archives, we got archiving the culinary practices, the rituals, the song traditions of uh, the Kohli community. And move. So Dara Kolbe, many of you must be familiar uh, as a photojournalist, but also an important artist who has been extensively documenting the manual scavenging dalits. And uh, he has this uh, uh, black and white uh, aesthetics that he used to depict the harsh realities of these people who have been forced to do this uh, and also part of the caste system that the Shudra Dalit has to do the manual scavenging to clean the dalits. So he has been extensively documenting them, and many of them also die in the in the sea, which just uh, uh, the system. So, and this is finally uh, Sajan Mani, a young artist from Kerala, now based in Germany. And uh, this particular work is based on a 19th century Dalit Christian who converted to Christianity and became very popular through uh, an organization called Pratyaksha Raksha Deva Sabha. It's like the organization of physical God's salvation. And uh, Apachan wrote a lot of poetry, hymns, and songs, uh, not only praising the God, but also talking about the marginalized body, attempting to find salvation. So it was a political response to also the situation of caste in Kerala at that time, and also why the left abandoned the question of caste for a long time in Indian country. So, this is Sajid's performance at a uh, very moving, important statement which he has made and I would like to uh, conclude the presentation by it. So why I am showing you all this is that uh, for the first time in the last 20 years, uh, artists from the background, Adivasi background and minorities have enriched the question on caste and why these practices were and why these important issues uh, and also Issues of violence, oppression were abandoned from Indian border and contemporary art, where art was celebrating uh, globalizing practices and welcoming uh, what you call a certain sort of parachuted ideas of what contemporary is from Europe, while there was a different reality in society. And this also expands the uh, what you call the material realm of art practice. So all this kind of repurposed saris, loudspeakers, the lords, the black body performance, and, and bringing in uh, text which is also based on the folk songs of the Dalits. So it enriches the material, the cultural, the textual quality of existing contemporary art, visuality, produces a counter visual culture uh, which is very unsettling for the typical metropolitan Yangi going person. And so yes, art is the problem and art can also be solution, is what I say. Thank you, Ramesh. I uh, just wondered if you had a question for Ruth before we go to the end. Just wanted to ask you a general question about uh, how could we extend the idea of the concept of nursing and caring into the artistic research, and what should an artist think uh, when they are kind of? Um, I think this is a really interesting question. So, um, one of the projects that I'm 
working on at the moment is uh, we've invited nurses who are also artists to share something they've made in response to the pandemic. And we've received about 40 submissions. And then we've asked art students who are ceramicists, printmakers, visual artists, filmmakers, etc., to develop a response to the nurse's response. And then what we're going to be doing is showing it as part of a festival called the Big Anxiety Festival in October. And we're going to have the both pieces speaking to each other, if you like. And then what will happen is the nurses are going to be gifted that they'll get their own piece back, but they'll be gifted the piece by the artist. And we've called it a gift exchange. And we're going to have lots of conversations because what we felt like was we have other people making archives of COVID, but not nurses who have been directly caring for people. And one of the things that has been really interesting for me working with students who've elected to be part of this project. It was oversubscribed among our art students. They're like, yes, we, we feel like we look too inwardly and we want to respond somehow to this massive crisis that's affecting the whole world in such a profound way. We feel helpless. We want to give gifts to nurses. And so what we did, this is to answer your question about care, because what I'm finding is a lot of artists are talking about care. Yeah. And for me, and this is very difficult, and, and Minakshi, it might resonate with you as well, the challenge of being a nurse is care is not selective. And I feel like for artists, it's, a, it's optional. You can care if you want to. But a nurse or a psychiatrist or other health professionals, it's kind of like, you just care for everybody. It doesn't matter if that person is smelly, so I don't mean to point to you. It doesn't matter if that person is smelly, dirty, rude, obnoxious. You care with unconditional, positive regard, great generosity, often at huge personal cost. So what we did with the students was we randomised them. You know, in terms of matching them with a nurse, whose work they would respond to. And some of the art students were very angry about it because we had a big discussion about should we just let the students just choose the nurse who they wanted to respond to or should we put them in a position where they have to find something inside themselves that will connect to the art, artist, uh, the person's work. And there were a few art students who were just absolutely angry. That's like, that's not art. How can I respond to that, you know? Um, and so that's something that I'm very interested in because nurses are called to care universally in a way that's very challenging and demanding. Um, and so what does it mean when care is not optional and when it's a requirement? What does it mean and, and of course, we've got a problem in health. I, I, I don't know so much about Goa because I don't live here. But, but certainly in settler nations uh, and in colonising nations like uh, England, uh, we talk about a crisis of care. We talk about callous disregard for people that's endemic in the system. And part of that is it's a highly gendered workforce that really is uh, the challenge of COVID, um, and COVID feels very fresh for me because we had uh, one of the world's biggest lockdowns in, in Australia, Melbourne, where we live. And so, you know, I saw four people in one year apart from this dear one here, you know. Um, and of course, my Facebook friends. How, how, how do we care when we have to care? And what does it mean to have to care for the stranger, for whom we have no connection whatsoever. What is the imperative? So I'll answer your question with a question. <laughs> one, one more sentence. Only one sentence. One sentence. There's so much to say. We just. 
I feel like we're just pulling up. We're just yeah. pulling up. Hey, we've just started. Maybe we should go out. We will discuss it. I just wanted to add that decolonizing research definitely means that we have to decolonize it from the Eurocentric perspective, but also we have to decolonize it from the internal colonization of caste and other forms of oppression, which we have to understand. So decolonization again simply doesn't mean it has to be from Eurocentrism. Thank you, Pramjish. Thank you, Ruth. And I think that leaves us with a very uh, important set of questions uh, because I think, like like Ruth, uh, you know, I've also noticed in the art environment that the the concept of care is something that everyone likes to talk about, and perhaps it's also related to an idea that caring is somehow no longer natural, but is also um, in the West. Uh, the aged care sector or the child care sector uh, uh, fast growing um, businesses um, where you know perhaps emanating from a, uh, you know, um, a you know, British heritage of public health which aimed to provide universal health care even though it didn't but um, you know, when you mentioned this idea of universality that the nurse is required to bring, which is very different from the artists, um, we've also had a, a, a history where uh, in a certain governmental or societal structure, the idea of access to art or art education was seen as something which is perhaps universal or could be universal. And uh, certainly, we seem to be in a society, um, or in a globe at the moment, which is um, privatizing uh, the access to um, parts of living that we had previously thought would be available to everyone. And uh, maybe that's a connection point that's said for me about the changes happening in the art sector and the changes happening in the health sector that we have, have us talking about care and care and care in this way. So, um, I, um, we could keep talking here for a long time, but I'm conscious that we have, have been coming up to an hour and we have people in the audience, so perhaps um, uh, I can uh, pass to you at this time to see if you have anything from the floor. Thank you so much, all of you. Very stimulating discussion. Um, I, I want to abuse my position to moderate and ask the first set of questions before I turn it over to the audience. Uh, and for both of you, really, it's a very similar question about capitalism and uh, compartmentalisation. Ruth, I was thinking particularly about this issue of care and how there's a growing gulf between the idea of care and affect. Uh, especially in global societies where one sees the first world importing nurses of colour, uh, caretakers of colour, right, to do the work, the affective work of care that would then allow a, a working mother, right, to go and perform labour as well. So for you, this question of the, the growing gulf between care and affect in a commercialised situation. And Prendish, um, I, I couldn't help but think about uh, situations that I find myself in, very much like Ruth. Um, I work in uh, what's known as a PWI, a predominantly white institution. <laughs> There's a name for it. Uh, and, and often I think, you know, because as a person of colour teaching literature of colour, right, I often feel like I'm creating white liberal subjects where they get a very multicultural education from me. Right, and then are able to deploy that in the sense of being able to say, look, I, I know these things, right? But it doesn't it doesn't fundamentally change them, right? And so with what you're saying, and, and I recognize that I think it's very important about you know decolonizing these approaches to uh, thinking about is it the, the, the role of you know how do we center ability and disability and cause, right? as being important, very important work to do, but to not make them categories to be consumed. 
that your children and your health services um, so that you can work, you know, stratified reproduction. But um, this whole kind of brain circulation, brain drain or brain gain, is a really important conversation because um, without nurses from, say, Kerala particularly, uh, in the Philippines, health services around the world would collapse. They truly would. Um, but one of the things that we're facing, particularly in Australia, is with the aging population, you know, the baby boomers, having people of colour caring for them in their older years, but having these old racist ideas about people and the superiority and inferiority of certain groups of people has been utterly profound. So um, there's a lot of pushback on that where we have uh, people who said, oh, um, no, I don't, I don't want a brown nurse. I want a New Zealand trained nurse, which is really code for saying I want a white nurse. So, um, yeah, it's a really, these gender dynamics are really interesting. And then, you know, I couldn't help thinking about the stratified reproduction thing because I've got family in Navelli who were brought up by their father and older siblings because their mother was in Abu Dhabi, you know. Uh, and then at the same time, I grew up in um, Nairobi and I had an ayah look after me who also had to kind of manage looking after her own children. So, you know, like, I'm, how do we manage these sort of complicities? Because, you know, I don't see myself as innocent in any of these kind of contexts. I'm part of the problem. I'm colluding with all of these. And in a way, I want to maintain that troubling of my own position in all these spaces because I think it's a very productive place to kind of really interrogate um, who I am in the world and the how and the why of why I do something. It's all about me. <laughs> Thank you, Bernie. And uh, you have asked something that has bothered me for a long time. And so I encounter students uh, who come up with what uh, Professor Vyas Aloni, who has extensively written on discrimination and caste, uh, how caste functions in contemporary Indian art, and generally also, uh, he talks about it as protective ignorance. The kids and the youngsters who come and say that we don't know about caste, we don't know about caste discrimination, and from that they encounter it as a concept and then go out as what you said, become the benevolent understanding figures, but perpetuate the same uh, privileges, the same systematic discrimination and all. So, uh, what I am trying to do is uh, to make them realize that the knowledge systems they have inherited are uh, colonial, they are Brahmanical, which is the, the, that is casteist. And the idea of art and art history and art practices which they have inherited are also these. And so in order to do that, they have to develop the broken person, or they have to understand the broken person paradigm in order to dismantle these forms of knowledge production. And they have to unlearn, they have to understand the struggle, which is a historic struggle. They have to work closely and understand what these and thinkers are trying to say and not take their voice, not speak on their behalf, but work with them. Work with them. Like nobody is saying that you don't work with them. Uh, work with them. Try to understand what is happening, but not hijack spaces. These are very important. Not become their voices. Not speak on their behalf. But develop a critical perspective and Dalit criticism is, or uh, Dalit activism, and Dalit politics is about having a strong vocal, critical, cultural politics. To develop that is to against, uh, it's to go against the existing cultural hegemony which exists around us. So that is what I want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, on that wonderful preparational moment, I'd like to thank our panelists today, Prenjish, Ruth, and Dani. Uh, uh, a big round of applause for you. Thank you.